Good morning. And thank you for attending the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedoms hearing today on religious freedom in Nigeria, extremism and government inaction. I would like to thank our distinguished witnesses for joining us. The U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, or USERF, is an independent bipartisan U.S. government advisory body created by the 1998 International Religious Freedom Act, or IRFA. We are honored today to have the author of IRFA, Congressman Frank Wolf, with us. The commission uses international standards to monitor the freedom of religion or belief abroad and makes policy recommendations to the United States government. Today, USERF exercises its statutory authority under IRFA to convene this virtual hearing. USERF has monitored religious freedom conditions in Nigeria for two decades, and since 2009 has recommended the Secretary of State designate Nigeria a country of particular concern, or CPC, for engaging in ongoing systematic and egregious violations of religious freedom. Unfortunately, Nigerians continue to face significant obstacles in exercising their right to the freedom of religion or belief. Nigeria, home to nearly 220 million people, boasts tremendous religious diversity, with approximately half the population identifying as Muslim and nearly half identifying as Christian. Nigerians also express Jewish, Buddhist, Hindu, Baha'i, and atheist beliefs, among others. The Nigerian constitution, adopted in 1999 during the country's transition to democratic rule, protects freedom of religion for all citizens. Yet, as US, USERF has consistently documented, in practice, many Nigerians face opposition in exercising this right. In December, the State Department designated Nigeria a country of particular concern for the first time. Nigeria is the first secular democracy to have received this designation from the State Department. I will now turn it over to Vice Chair Perkins to discuss some of the religious freedom challenges in Nigeria that bring us together today for this hearing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Bargava. And I would like to, uh, to join in welcoming you all to today's hearing. You know, today we'll explore some of the most common religious freedom violations Nigerians face, along with possible solutions for addressing the violence targeting religious communities. In many areas of Nigeria, non-state actors attack religious leaders and houses of worship with impunity and abduct and ex execute individuals based on their uh, religious identity. This includes militant Islamist groups like Boko Haram and Islamic State in West Africa both of which the State Department has designated as entities of particular concern for religious freedom violations in line with USERF's recommendations. Islamic State in West Africa province or ISWAP has held Leah Sherabu hostage for more than four years simply for refusing to renounce her Christian faith. Leah Sherabu uh, turned 18 years old this year and uh, she is one that I advocate for as a part of our Religious Prisoners of Conscience project. Boko Haram attacked three Christian communities in northern Nigeria on Christmas Eve. And just last month, armed assailants attacked two Muslim congregations worshiping at mosques during Ramadan. Unknown gun gunmen recently stormed a church and abducted a pastor in Ando uh, State. Uh, demonstrating the alarming spread of these types of attacks into the south of the country. Now, in many parts of the country, religious identity intersects with ethnicity and politics to fuel retaliatory cycles of identity-based violence, resulting in thousands of, civil of civilian deaths each year. In addition, Sharia courts in the north of the country have upheld blasphemy laws against Muslim minorities and authorities have illegally detained individuals based on their religious beliefs and expression. For example, authorities in uh, Kano uh, state uh, continue to hold uh, human rights activist uh, Mubarak Bala in detention for expressing his atheist beliefs despite a federal court order issued in December declaring his detention unconstitutional and demanding his release. Uh, one of USERF's commissioners, Fred Davey, uh, advocates for a religious prisoner of conscience, um, Mubarak uh, Bala, in our program. Now, Davey's also uh, 
advocates for a Nigerian Islamic gospel musician, uh, Yahya Shah Ami, knew who is currently imprisoned for allegedly violating blasphemy laws. Now, urgent action is needed to reduce these violations and hold perpetrators accountable. Today, we've assembled a, an expert panel of witnesses and based upon their testimonies discussing these issues, uh, we hope that we will be able to provide uh, some solid recommendations to the US government that they can implement to better support the Nigerian people that are facing these atrocities on an ongoing basis. Uh, I'll now uh, turn the floor back over to Chair Bargava to introduce uh, our witnesses for today's hearing. Thank you so much, Vice Chair Perkins. We have such an extraordinary uh, group of witnesses and, and experts to, to share uh, their perspectives on working in Nigeria uh, with us today. I, I'm, I'm really honored to be able to start our introductions with uh, Frank Wolf. And as I mentioned, uh, Congressman Wolf, the author of the International Religious Freedom Act, uh, he served in the US House of Representatives um, from Virginia uh, for uh, 17 terms uh, and has been a champion of work on human rights and religious freedom for so many of us. Uh, he, among other things, uh, not only authored IRFA, was, uh, was, was in, in that way uh, the, the force that created the International Religious Freedom Office at the State Department, uh, headed by the ambassador at large, and, um, and USERF itself. And so he founded and served as the co-chairman of the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission, uh, which has been an extraordinary partner in this work. And, um, and among other things is, uh, is part of the 21st Century Wilberforce Initiative, um, who, uh, where, where he retired in, in 2018 as a distinguished senior fellow, uh, but, but in many ways continue to catalyze uh, the, the ways in which we are trying to engender interest and focus in Congress and other places on, uh, on religious freedom internationally. Uh, he is going to start off um, today, and then we're going to turn to Mike Jobbins, who leads global affairs and partnerships at Search for Common Ground, where he designs, develops, and manages conflict resolution, violence prevention, and inclusive government governance programs, uh, particularly in, in 22 countries uh, around Africa. And, and then we will turn uh, to Hafsat Maina Mohammed, who leads the, the Choice for Peace, Gender, and Development Kapgad in Nigeria, which specializes in eradicating conditions that allow for violent extremist behavior of at-risk youth, women's development and empowerment for young girls and promotes positive mes messages to the younger generation. Prior to moving to the United States, Hafsat worked tirelessly at the Interfaith Mediation Center in Kaduna. We will then turn to Father Anthony Bature, who is among other things, the author of The Quest for Peace and Development in Wakari, Promoting Peace Education in Nigeria, a case study on building a paradigm for peace, peace education, and development. And he has contributed to many articles in national and international journals. He is currently the head of development of religious studies and the cha chaplain uh, of St. Francis of Assisi Chaplaincy at the Federal University of Technology in Wukari. Tomas Husted is an analyst in African affairs at the Congressional Research Service, where he covers co the countries of West and Central Africa. And prior to joining CRS, he worked with the International Rescue Committee in Sierra Leone, the National Democratic Institute, and the ENEF Project. I hope you will join us all in welcoming this extraordinary set of witnesses today. And let me turn to Congressman Frank Wolf. I, I want to thank the commissioners, and I want to thank uh, the commission staff for having this hearing and for the good work that they that they do. All you have to do is to read the May 31st article in Foreign Affairs Magazine by former Ambassador John Campbell and Robert Rutberg titled, The Giant of Africa is Failing. Ambassador Campbell is now with the Council on Foreign Relations. Mr. Rutberg is President Emeritus of the World Peace Foundation. Nigeria is the largest country in Africa with roughly 219 million people. In fact, as in the year 2050, there'll be more people in Nigeria than there will be here in the United States. And the article says, quote, that is why state failure in Nigeria is having profound consequences for the entire region and beyond. 
It bodes especially ill for the stability and well being of weak states in Nigeria's vicinity, as evidenced by the spread of jihadi and criminal groups to Burkina Faso, Cameroon, Chad, Ivory Coast, Mali, and Niger. In Nigeria today, there's genocide by Boko Haram, there's genocide activity by Fulani militants, there's rampant hunger, according to the World Food Program. There's little or no education in many parts of the country. There's sexual trafficking. There's massive, massive government corruption. There's human rights abuses by the military and mass, mass migration out of Nigeria. And we see little action by the West, including the United States. We can talk about how bad things are, but I want to offer and suggest two recommendations to deal with this issue. First, our government needs trusted input that can help U.S. policymakers to achieve mitigation and ultimate solutions. The idea stood out from the pages of Robert Kaplan's latest book, one of the best books I've read, The Good American, The Epic Life of Bob Grissoni, the U.S. government's greatest humanitarian. Bob Grissoni is an independent consultant who has provided to State Department and USAID decision makers over the years with indispensable ground truth information to help deal with major international humanitarian crisis, both under Republican and Democratic administrations. Bob Grassoni has agreed to travel to Nigeria and provide a report if asked by the State Department or USAID. My second recommendation is that I believe we need a special envoy for Nigeria and the Lake Chad region. The problems of Nigeria have spilled over into the neighboring countries, Ambassador Campbell's uh, article covers it, of the Lake Chad region. Boko Haram, Fulani militants, and ISIS are now operating in these countries. The special envoy would work with all the American ambassadors in Nigeria and the surrounding countries as well. The special envoy can coordinate the U.S. response to the crisis by various agencies of our government and will work with our European allies and also with the UN and other international agencies, such as the World Food Program. There is precedent for a special envoy. In the year 2001, President Bush appointed former Senator John Danforth to be the special envoy for Sudan. This was a very, very successful effort. In a Wall Street Journal article in December 2019, Bernard Enri Levy said that what is happening in Nigeria could lead to a Darfur or a Rwanda. When the world and the US ignored, and the world did ignore it, America ignored it, the UN ignored it, genocide in Rwanda, hundreds of thousands of people died. History is repeating itself. Because of the atrocities in Rwanda that we had ignored, President Bill Clinton flew to Rwanda and apologized to the Rwandan people near the end of his term. If what is happening in Nigeria were happening in any country in Europe, the world would be enraged and engaged. But in Nigeria, there is no action. In the 20th century, British, 19th century British parliamentarian William Wilberforce said this to his fellow countrymen about the evils of the slave trade. Wilberforce said, you may choose to look the other way, but you can never again say you do not know. We do now know what's taking place in Nigeria, so we can't pretend that we do not. And Dr. Martin Luther King said, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Are we not in the United States friends of all the people in Nigeria? And a friend of German Lutheran pastor, an anti-Nazi dissident, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, silence, in the face of evil is evil itself. He said, not to speak is really to speak and not to act is to act. So I, I asked the commission to act boldly and support these recommendations for the sake of all the people of Nigeria. And again, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Congressman Wolf. Let me turn it over to Mike Jobbins. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman Bargava, uh, Vice Chair Perkins, and it's uh, all my fellow uh, panelists and, and esteemed commissioners, and particularly uh, uh, Frank Wolf, uh, uh, Congressman for all of your uh, excellent service on this issue. Uh, I'd like to add my voice uh, to yours in, in calling attention to, to really what ought to be a, a top priority in, in my 
uh, opinion uh, of the administration. As, as uh, Chairwoman uh, Bargava said in, in the introduction, I serve with Search for Common Ground, uh, an international peace building organization committed to Nigeria. Uh, we have uh, 100 uh, colleagues uh, across the country and uh, all of whom are very deeply uh, concerned, care uh, uh, and engaged uh, on this issue. That said, uh, my opinions are, are mine alone. Um, and in the uh, interest of, of brevity, I'll also refer uh, the commissioners and, and any and uh, participants uh, to my written submission uh, for um, uh, for the website. Um, I want to focus uh, in on three things. First, in terms of the gravity of the situation, to build on uh, what uh, Congressman Wolf uh, said, it, it's hard to uh, underestimate the, the level of severity of the current crisis. Uh, in the last year, 8,668 people were killed in armed attacks. Uh, that's one every hour on average, or in other words, uh, two will be killed by the end of this hearing um, as a result of the uh, ongoing violence. Not all of this uh, violence is directly attributable to violent extremism. Not all of it is uh, attributable uh, uh, to the kinds of rural and violence that we're seeing unfolding in the middle belt, um, but a lot of it is. And so I'll focus on, on three uh, key dynamics that I think all of us should take into account and take to heart in terms of why uh, action is necessary and why action is particularly necessary now. Uh, the first is in the northwest or northeast of the country. We've seen a transformation um, uh, of the Boko Haram phenomenon with the rise and in increasing uh, activity by ISWAP, the Islamic State affiliate in, in the region. Uh, at uh, present, uh, significant amounts of the population are living under uh, their control. Uh, government control and population, and much of the population is confined to a network of about 45 garrison towns or cantonments uh, throughout that region. And we've seen a particular uh, use of religious discriminatory tactics and, and by religiously motivated violence by ISWAP, particularly in the last six to nine months, an increase in so-called stop and search activities where public uh, buses, taxis are stopped, People are, are looked at for their uh, presumed religious identity based on their, their national identity cards. And then uh, Christians uh, are, are taken away, abducted or killed. And so we've seen uh, in, in the Northeast, particularly concerning. In the uh, rest of the country, we saw a phenomenon of rural violence, both criminal, uh, intercommunal and natural resource-based conflict that, that began in, in North Central and the Middle Belt uh, over the past few years really grow uh, significantly over the past uh, uh, in recent years. And so today, um, almost every uh, geopolitical zone of Nigeria is affected from uh, the Delta to the Southeast. Uh, we saw uh, just uh, uh, this week, attacks by unidentified gun gunmen in Ingangang in the Southwest, which had, had not experienced that level of uh, violence, in particular uh, escalations in the Northwest uh, of the country. We're in an escalatory cycle where uh, the combination of an economic crash triggered by COVID and low oil prices has led the price of food to double in the market. So you have increasingly desperate people, you have increasingly cynical uh, criminal and political actors uh, eager to cast their materialistic and personal interests in the cloak of religion and ethnicity. And you have a context of a security force that's overstretched with the military deployed in more than two thirds of the active, uh, in inactive uh, military operations in more than two thirds of, of Nigeria's states. So it's an incredibly fractious situation where the, the trend lines uh, are all favoring uh, uh, escalation in, as Congressman Wolf said, uh, Africa's largest economy, one of America's uh, deepest partners with whom we do $10 billion uh, of trade uh, each year and, and a country where uh, more children are born each year than in the entire Middle East put together. Uh, so this is a, is a critical moment, a critical uh, point for, for the U.S. to act. And uh, as we do, I'm particularly pleased to have uh, both Father Bature and Hafsat uh, coming after me to highlight uh, the fact that uh, there are a number of positive efforts underway by Nigerian civil society activists, faith leaders, media professionals. And it's around those kind of efforts that the U.S. should be rallying uh, its support. And so as I close, I'd like to leave you and this group with five quick recommendations for both the Biden administration as well as uh, leaders in both uh, chambers of Congress. Uh, the first is that in both analysis and public messaging, it's absolutely vital that all external actors right size, uh, uh, draw attention to this crisis and right size the role of religion uh, therein. Overstating the role of religion uh, feeds the flames and fans the interests of those who are using uh, or trying to co-opt uh, uh, religion for their own uh, violent purposes. 
On the other hand, uh, talking past the conflict, framing it in terms of immutable long-term trends that doesn't uh, draw sufficient attention to the way that uh, the uh, identity-based motivations are, are taking place, uh, disrespects the victims and also is analytically uh, uh, dishonest. Two, the, both Congress and the administration need to budget appropriately. Uh, less than 3% of foreign assistance to Nigeria goes to peace and security. That needs to change and we need efforts both like the Peace and uh, Prevention and Security Fund to support long-term stabilization. We need democracy, human rights and governance uh, efforts and, and assistance to go to, to Nigeria. And we need uh, some of the rapid response uh, mechanisms that Congress makes available to the president, for the Complex Crisis Fund, the Atrocities Prevention Fund uh, to enable the State Department and enable USAID to support good work of the kind that we're, we're about to hear uh, from Hafsat and Father Bature. Uh, third, this, this, we need a whole of government response. I was pleased to hear the creative ideas laid out by Congressman Wolf, and there's an enormous opportunity for the administration to think creatively about how we rally the whole of the US government uh, to support, support this. Economic frustrations, deep security and injustice are things that aren't necessarily within the human rights tool house, uh, uh, toolbox. And yet we know that USDA is a key agricultural partner for rural security. We know that USDFC is playing a key role in terms of shoring up investments and creating a better future for the people affected by this conflict. And so we need to see how we use the full uh, amount of both conflict and, and human rights tools in line uh, with uh, the economic instruments. Um, and then finally, um, uh, I think the last two that I would, would highlight, one is to focus on the role of the cultural heritage and conservation, destroy holy sites uh, that Congressman Wolf and Vice Chair Perkins alluded to uh, need to be rebuilt. There's a tremendous opportunity uh, uh, through the Ambassador's Self-Help Fund, uh, through uh, the Smithsonian and other kinds of, of institutions that have particular expertise in rebuilding and restoring holy sites. And then finally, um, again, building on uh, Congressman Wolf's uh, suggestion, we fundamentally need a conflict geography approach. We know that many of the perpetrators in viol of violence in Nigeria are not from Nigeria. And we know that they're deeply enmeshed across the Sahel uh, and in, into littoral states in illicit networks uh, movements of, of armed men and, 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 and goods and, and smuggling, and there needs to be a wider approach. Typically, the U.S. divides between sort of the Francophone Sahel and, and Anglophone Nigeria and its policymaking. There's a particular need to, to integrate those two and arrive at a common uh, vision and program. So I thank you very much uh, uh, for, your, uh, for, for inviting me and look forward to the questions and discussion. Thank you so much, Mike. I, I'm, I want to turn now to Hafset. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I've introduced myself already. Um, uh, but for those who have not, um, who do not know me, I am Hafsa Tamayna Mohammed again, and I am the founder of Choice for Peace, Gender and Development in Nigeria, and I'm based here in Maryland now. I've worked um, with a lot of religious um, organizations and, and um, the community back in Nigeria and the government in ensuring that we bring peace or we have a dialogue setting where people can safely have a safe haven to speak about their religious differences or religious opinions. Um, and it's acceptable with no, no um, bias or, or, or intimidation or prosecution. Um, I come from the northeastern part of Nigeria, Borno State to be precise, and uh, goes a local government. I, I, I'm just, I'm going to keep this short with a short story, you know, it's going to be like um, short stories. So when, when I was back in Nigeria, I faced prosecution from Boko Haram and also prosecution from the government, mainly because one, I'm a woman, and then number two, I'm a Muslim. So apparently there's a way a Muslim woman should behave or act or be in the society. Um, quote and in quotes, uh, the religious leaders there back in the Northern part of Nigeria say, I am, too, I am too educated and I am too outspoken, which I shouldn't be. I am telling you this because um, 
I can go ahead and read what I wrote in my testimony, but this is the reality of how it sticks with me and how I'm living with it. It's something that every day I ask, why was I prosecuted because I'm a Muslim woman and why should I have to act the way they want me to act or believe what they want me to believe? Um, Boko Haram unleashed mayhem in my local government, in the state, in the whole region, and to me personally. They, I, I've been a victim of a rape from these people. I've been a victim of, of beating, of brutal beating. I've been a victim of their incarcerations and I've escaped severally. I call myself a cat with nine lives, if that makes sense. But this is not, this is to say that many women and many people in Nigeria, especially in the northeastern part of Nigeria, regardless of their faith, and this is what I believe based on research and what I've seen, regardless of them being Muslims or Christians, are have faced persecution on, and are still facing persecutions. A lot of them are still there because they have nowhere to go. They have nothing to turn to. So in the end, they are stuck where they are. I am privileged to be out of a situation that I once thought I would never come out alive from. A lot of people, um, especially women, especially Muslim women are degraded or subjected to what the society wants them to be subjected to. And thus they turn to terrorists. A lot of them have turned to this jihadist or Boko Haram, you know, to give them succor because they want to be safe. And this is wrong at all levels. So what I did back in Nigeria before I came was try to see that we have a communication where they would understand that they do not have to turn to this. They can still you know, live with their dignity. But how do you tell a poor woman or a poor widow or orphans or female orphans that they could do that when they are hungry, they feel unsafe, there's a lot of insecurity and they're being murdered and slaughtered in front of their uh, um, in front of their peers. This is what I've seen. This is what ha this has happened in my eyes in front of me where women um, are cut open and babies are taken out of them. And I would have to run to, to the bush or to the forest to pick up these babies and, and go take them somewhere. I did it single-handedly. Do I want to be praised for it? No, but a lot of these things, the government in Nigeria, we know for far too long, is not working. The laws are not working. Thus, these things keep happening. For me, I believe, yes, there is um, religious intolerance, but it's not about Islam. It's not about Christianity. It's not about Hinduism or Buddhism. It's about a people that cannot come together to live in peace and understand each other respectfully. There is lack of tolerance. There is lack of mediation. People in Nigeria government and terrorists and jihadists, they want to inflict pain by forcing people to believe what they believe or act the way they want them to, to act. The US government has been in Nigeria for a very long time. It's uh, Nigeria, it's a partner, you know, for, with the US government. I, what I'm saying, what I want to say here, really short, and this is what I will say finally, is that the US government needs to focus on the Nigerian government mm -hmm. and, I don't know, educating them perhaps, or, or, or bringing them to highlight of saying, communicate with your people, go down to the grassroots. They can't stay in the office in the Aso Villa and expect things to work. So there is no religious freedom. So people are prosecuted. Bala is still incarcerated and a lot of people who do not believe in anything, you know, because the Nigerian government feels it can do and undo from its bedside. And there's no accountability, no transparency. Thank you. Thank you, Hafsa. Uh, and thank you for sharing your, your experiences firsthand. I will turn to Tomas. Is, uh, let me turn to you if that works for you, and then I will come back to Father Bature. Great. Thank you. Um, so many thanks to the Commission for the invitation to join this discussion on religious freedom in Nigeria. And as requested, I will focus my attention on non-state threats to religious freedom, selected U.S. responses, and potential considerations for U.S. policymakers. 
Successive administrations have described the U.S. relationship with Nigeria as among the most important in Africa. Nevertheless, U.S. policymakers have expressed concern over threats to religious freedom in Nigeria, particularly in the predominantly Muslim North and in the religiously and ethnically diverse Middle Belt region, which lies between the North and the majority Christian South. In recent years, U.S. officials have focused attention on two trends regarding non-state threats to religious freedom. Boko Haram and Islamic State West Africa province attacks in the Northeast, targeting Muslim and Christian individuals, ceremonies, and houses of worship, and disputes in the Middle Belt between predominantly Christian farmers and mainly Muslim pastoralists, which, while generally not primarily driven by religious ideology, according to various analyses, can assume religious dimensions and spur violence along sectarian lines. Security responses generally have proven insufficient to protect local civilians from these threats. In the Northeast, the government has periodically reasserted control over contested territory. Security gains often have been short-lived, however, and security services have been implicated in extensive abuses. In the Middle Belt, farmer herder clashes and related violence often have outstripped responses by military and law enforcement, and observers have accused security services of committing abuses, abandoning villages before the onset of violence, and failing to prosecute assailants. Several factors arguably have constrained the government's responses to insecurity. Defense sector corruption has reportedly impaired effectiveness. The Carnegie Endowment for International Peace has assessed that, quote, decades of unchecked corruption have hollowed out the Nigerian military and security services and rendered them unable to effectively combat Boko Haram or address ethno-religious and communal conflict, unquote. According to the State Department, insufficient capacity and staffing of domestic law enforcement agencies also have inhibited security efforts and resulted in a reliance on the military to respond to internal security threats. Meanwhile, many observers contend that efforts to stabilize conflict-affected zones and address core drivers of insecurity have been slow and inadequate. In the Northeast, corruption, poor coordination, low political commitment, and human rights abuses have been seen to hinder efforts to build trust in the government, improve service delivery, reintegrate former combatants, and foster cohesion. Attempts to develop enduring solutions to farmer herder conflicts also have faced challenges, as implementation of a national livestock transformation plan intended to help address resource disputes has experienced delays, research sh resource shortages, and opposition from both farmers and pastoralists. U.S. foreign aid programs in Nigeria have sought to help mitigate intercommunal tensions, address the causes of militant recruitment, and respond to insecurity. In the North and Middle Belt, for instance, the United States has funded programs focused on preventing violence and supporting intercommunal and interfaith dialogue. The United States also has provided security assistance to help strengthen Nigeria's counterterrorism responses and civilian law enforcement capacity in the Northeast. The State Department also has publicly expressed concern with the government's insufficient action to protect religious freedom. In 2019, it placed Nigeria on a special watch list under the International Religious Freedom Act, and in 2020 downgraded Nigeria to a country of particular concern, or CPC, for having engaged in or tolerated particularly severe violations of religious freedom. The specific grounds for Nigeria's CPC designation were not made public. In addition to the non-state threats I have discussed, Recent State Department reports on religious freedom in Nigeria also have highlighted state repression of the minority Shia community and concerns related to the Sharia legal system in the North, among other issues. Designation as a CPC can result in various punitive measures subject to a presidential waiver. The Trump administration waived these for Nigeria, citing the important national interest of the United States. Some policymakers and advocates have supported Nigeria's CPC designation and have called for punitive actions such as sanctions. Several considerations may shape U.S. responses to religious freedom conditions in Nigeria. Where violations of religious freedom stem from intercommunal violence, as in the Middle Belt, several factors may precipitate or stoke conflict. The State Department attributes farmer herder conflicts in the Middle Belt to land disputes, competition over dwindling resources, ethnic differences, and settler indigent tensions, while assessing that ethno-cultural and religious affiliation contributed to and exacerbated some local conflicts. Some non-governmental organizations have described ethnic or religious motivations as a central driver of such violence. U.S. policymakers may debate the role of ethno-religious divisions vis-a-vis -vis other factors and the suitability of viewing such conflicts as primarily ethnic or sectarian in nature. More broadly, 
U.S. policymakers may debate the relative merit of various policy tools for reducing threats to religious freedom in Nigeria. Punitive measures targeting the Nigerian government, such as aid restrictions or targeted sanctions on Nigerian officials, could publicly reinforce U.S. concern about such threats and enact a cost on those perceived as responsible. Such measures also could impede pursuit of other U.S. policy goals, such as counterterrorism cooperation or diplomatic access and influence in other arenas. Increased U.S. security assistance might help Nigerian authorities restore security, but may also come into conflict with U.S. concerns over human rights abuses by Nigerian security personnel, which have constrained past U.S. security cooperation. Policymakers may continue to debate whether U.S. engagement reflects an appropriate balance of approaches and resources resource, 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 resource. for reducing threats to religious freedom in Nigeria. Thank you again for giving me the opportunity to speak with you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Thomas. And I believe we now have Father Baturi back with us. And so let me turn it to, to you, Father. I said I don't want to go into the academic part of uh, this uh, hearing. I just want to be very practical on what is happening because I'm on ground. As a Nigerian, I'm also uh, familiar with what is happening. Uh, freedom of religion is considered by many people and most nations to be a fundamental human right. Uh, religion, religion in Nigeria remain very poor with both state and societal penetrated violation. This, however, prompted a former U.S. group uh, or society. Undoubtedly, undoubtedly, Nigeria maintained a delicate balance between Muslims and Christians. The apparent religious sentiment and sectarianism manifest in religious loyalty. In religious loyalty and intolerance, sins, insecurity, and thoughts constitute a huge hindrance to social cohesion among the various religious groups in Nigeria. There are incidences of uh, religious extremism in Nigeria, which, which is often not uh, heard in the media, but I'd like to highlight this. Incidents of religious extremism. One, religious uh, membership of OIC, which is against secularity as enshrined in the constitution of Nigeria. And then we have uh, application of Sharia in Northern Nigeria to citizens and foreign nationals who are not Muslims by faith. The spillover of religious affairs into government decision leading to poor government, domestic and international policies. Over emphasis on Sharia law in the Nigeria constitution as we've heard from other speakers lack of social justice or fair equal equality of opportunity for all to strive in their identified areas of strength. Then here is where I mentioned about the religious uh, extremism by government inaction. Denial of uh, places of worship for the Christians in, in some part of uh, Northern Nigerian's institution and state. And to build a church is never allowed in some places of worship, for worship. Of course, there are farmers, headers, conflict issues. And one of the prominent issues that affects us, especially in Nigeria, which is causing uh, conflict between Christians and Muslims, is what I refer to as white martyrdom, where our young Christian girls are being taken over for marriage by our Muslim brothers. No recourse to parent, no parental consent. And that has been creating problem. And land that have been allocated in some cases have been revoked for religious purposes. And government inactions since exacerbated the crisis. You will recall that General Tiwa Danjuma did mention uh, a year and a half ago that there are issues that people need to, to protect themselves, community need to protect themselves because the government is no longer going to protect them. So the 
constitution of Nigeria itself, which talks about uh, secularity and not acceptance or taking of one religion over the other, seems to give pre uh, pre prevalent to the, uh, the Islamic religion over Christianity, and that has been creating problems in Nigeria. So the, the, the introduction of the Islamic legal code, popularly known as Sharia, which some of the speakers must have talked about, by the then governor Ahmed Yerima of Zamfara State in 1999 resulted in violent protests. And this has escalated in 2000 when the then governor Ahmed Makarfi initiated the process of introducing the same law in Kaduna State. Evidently, Nigerians have waited too long for the violence orchestrated by religious intolerance to stop. Rather, it has been escalating. Religious freedom conditions in Nigeria deteriorated over the past decade. In fact, the ongoing attack against Christian communities, Muslim congregation and houses of worship in most part of the Northeast and North Central geopolitical zone of Nigeria is very worrisome. There are reports that more than 600 students have been abducted from schools in Northwest Nigeria since December 2020 till date. This abduction perpetrated by armed criminal gangs resemble tactics commonly employed by Boko Haram and other militant Islamic groups in Northern Nigeria. The killing of the Adamawa uh, Khan chairman, Christian Association of Nigerian chairman, who was ki kidnapped and executed by, by Boko Haram terrorists. Uh, the government seems not to have done anything about it. And uh, this has created uh, a lot of uh, loss of hope on the government of the Federation. We have the recent one, which was just uh, a priest, Father Alfonso Bello of Sokoto Diocese was gruesomely murdered by bandits in his own parish. And up till now, nothing was done to apprehend the cop or method any uh, judicial uh, justice to that. All this built up to high level of mutual suspicion, rivalry, acrimony, discord, and hostility among the religious adherents. Nigerians no longer have peace and they cannot live in peace. So I want to truly concur with what we have rightly mentioned and quoting Martin Luther King Jr. that we cannot claim not to know what is going on in Nigeria. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Father Bature. Uh, we, we are gonna now open it up uh, to questions from the commissioners. Uh, I, I want to uh, thank you each uh, for sharing so much of the work that you have been engaged in for many decades in Nigeria and, and the experiences that you've each had directly uh, in, in trying to promote religious freedom and the ability of everyone to be able to exercise their faith. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with, with an initial question, which is one that I think we have struggled with at the commission for quite some time, which is that there are many, there's, there's so much complexity to the violence in, in Nigeria. There, there are many, many factors that underlie this. And, 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 and Mike spoke to this uh, earlier, which is that um, when, when we're trying to think about religion in the context of tribe, ethnicity, region, gender, as Hafsat spoke to, um, the expectations that are associated with that, how do we, uh, how do we think about giving um, proper recognition to the role that religion plays without exacerbating religious divides, without making it more uh, than, um, than it should be in, in, in the context of, uh, of trying to, 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 to address the kind of violence that, is, that has been associated with religion. And so I, I, I know it's a, it's a complex question, but it's one that we, we are often trying to, to figure out how we, uh, how we focus on religion and yet also account for the many factors that go into uh, the kind of violence that, the, and, and persecution that we're seeing around the country. So I will, I will open it up with that difficult question um, to, to Congressman Wolf and to, to others who, who have spoken to that for, for quite some time, um, but, but would welcome anyone's, uh, anyone's responses on that, on that question. Uh, 
Uh, thank you. Uh, and that's why I made the recommendations with regard to Bob Gersoni, first of all, because you need a truth-based uh, environment where you really know what's going on. Uh, Bob Gersoni, who actually lives in Northern Virginia, has actually agreed to do this if asked by the State Department or AID. Bob, Bob Gersoni, he was the one who did all the work with regard to the Lord's Resistance Army. He's worked in Mozambique. So I, th I think you need a, a, a person who understands, who's not partisan on a truth based to really find out uh, what's going on. Secondly, I think that's why you need the special on, envoy. When the special envoy was appointed, it was supported in the Congress by both Republicans and Democrats. I believe Speaker Pelosi was very supportive of, 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 of this. Uh, everyone was because you had John Danforth who has such credibility and he was able to coordinate all the aspects of our government. It is just one person doing one thing. You, what are you gonna do with the DID? What are you gonna do with World Food Program? What about the US AID? What about US agriculture? So the, the combination uh, of Bob Grassoni gone there, who has a reputation of working with ambassadors, not a person who's gonna upset things, to really come back with the truth based, what's really going on based on the experience. And I heard people, please, please read a Kaplan's book. But secondly, then as somebody who has the confidence of, of the president, because John Danforth was a United States Senator, he was well-respected by Colin Powell, he was able to pick up the phone and call Secretary Powell. So I think you need those two things to kind of deal with it. We can talk about how bad it is, what some of the problems are, but the question is, how do you resolve what they are and what do you actually do about it? Thank you, Congressman. And uh, do others have this uh, thoughts on this this question of how to actually disentangle or or, or find ways in which to focus on religion um, that doesn't exacerbate or give too much credence to to the way in which religion plays a role? Um, I, I might might point to um, to three suggestions in, in addition to to those from from Congressman Wolf. Um, one is, is as uh, Father Vittori highlighted, um, there are a number of, of other questions related to religious freedom in Nigeria that aren't necessarily explicitly linked to the armed violence or, or, or in different kinds of ways. So questions about a Sharia law and, ha and, and customary law and how that sits alongside Article 38 of the Nigerian constitution that guarantees freedom of religion, uh, conscience and thought. And so there's a set of questions that could also be, be looked at and, and ought also to be looked at beyond only um, the, the violence, but the violence is certainly important. Uh, the second is, um, is I would encourage uh, both the US um, in its own analytical capacities, but also in its support to Nigerian uh, civil society and other institutions uh, to look for, to place a greater emphasis on supporting documentation. The Nigerian press and international reporting based on the Nigerian press is full of reports by unidentified gunmen um, uh, unidentified government attacked uh, in, in this location, in that location, and often with a presumption that this group or that group was, was responsible. Sometimes that's true. Sometimes that's not true. Sometimes it's manipulated by one or the other uh, case, in many cases, the armed actors themselves, in terms of who, who's, where the fingers are pointing. And so there needs to be a greater evident, uh, investment in evidence in, in, a, in research, and then particularly in criminal justice and accountability. Uh, and Regardless of, of the causes of, you know, the, the triggers of violence in the middle belt are in many cases natural resource based or historically have been natural resource based, but they're occurring on the backdrop of very grave uh, interreligious uh, and interethnic riots in Joss and Kaduna and Kano and elsewhere. And to the extent that there's not accountability for past incidents of, uh, of religious violence, it feeds a dynamic where um, uh, uh, both of, of real memory by, by you lived, lived memory by humans who've experienced it, but also it feeds into a narrative that incentivizes and creates a, a channel uh, for a, any would-be criminal, any bandit, any political operator to say, remember what happened and, and use that as a way to, to rally support um, uh, uh, to their own cause. Um, and then finally, um, often when we talk about religion in, uh, in Nigeria, there's naturally um, a focus on, on the, the ills. Um, but, you know, religion for each of us and, and for everyone who has, has their own personal faith and, and the, the structure, you know, it, faith brings uh, both a, a set of worldviews and values and in many cases they acknowledge what's sacred across societies and across space. And we know, um, separate from the wider social issues and conflicts, 
the Nigerian people themselves, uh, three quarters of them see diversity as a source of strength in communities. We see that Nigerians of faith uh, have mutual respect uh, across that at an ordinary citizen level. And so there's a tremendous opportunity to invest in engagement in faith communities. And I know um, that Father Batura leads some, uh, Hafsat uh, worked with Interfaith Mediation Center, um, another uh, excellent organization. And there's a number of other ways to invest uh, with and work with and alongside religious institutions uh, as part of the solution and not only uh, as part of the problem in, in a way that's equitable, in a way that's aligned with our own First Amendment um, and, uh, uh, but, but I would highlight at least those three, um, a focus on solutions, a focus on accountability, um, uh, and, and then finally, and making sure that we're, we're sort of right-sizing uh, the frame um, in the context of, of wider challenges to, to religious freedom in the country. Thank you, Mike. Is anyone else? Um, Hassan, I know you, you raised some questions about this, the role of religion. So I will, you can, you can, I can leave that to, to, to later on uh, and to, to the questions I know that are coming from other commissioners or if you, you or others want to speak now, please do. All right, if not, uh, let me turn to Vice Chair Perkins and, uh, and then we'll turn to some of the other commissioners. Well, uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Chair Bargava. That was exactly kind of what I wanted to zero in on with Hassan. Because um, in her comments, she said that this really was not uh, Christian, Islam, religious, but the conflict was really driven by uh, intolerance. So I wanted to kind of better understand what was fomenting that intolerance. Uh, was that coming from government policy? Uh, was it coming from the different worldviews that were made reference to? So just trying to better understand what was uh, what is behind that. Thank you, um, Chairman. Well, what derives that, why I said intolerance is because um, back then when I was growing up, there was so much tolerance between Christians and Muslims where during Christmas, we would have food, we would have you know, dance parties, we would go to the events with no problem at all whatsoever. Our parents would literally take us there. I remember my dad as an eight-year-old, when I was eight-year-old, he told me, he said, they're your um, brothers. He never, he never um, identified my Christian, our Christian neighbors as neighbors. He called them our relatives. He called them our family. And this is how I was raised. And I was raised, you know, to even sing in the choir. He never had issues with it. And so many Muslim um, families I've seen um, interrelated and 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 co-marriages and whatever you know it's it's so much beauty back when i was growing up so there was so much tolerance then there was so much love so much um respect for each other and you will see the christians coming to our eid parties uh trying to do ramadan with us respecting the way we behave or act or our or, or the way we do things our timidness our our you know um our, our timidness, our shyness, they respected it. They never had issues with it. But today it's an issue. It's a big problem for me to even put my hijab on in Nigeria, a country that is known, especially Northern Nigeria, that is known for this. Women are known for this. It's a problem. It's a problem. Uh, we're being mocked. We're being, we're being disgraced. We're being harassed. A lot of women are being harassed. So there's no tolerance. People think that they could just disrespect me as a Muslim woman because I'm Muslim, not because they don't, they don't see me as Nigerian anymore. They don't see me as a person who has the basic right of freedom, the basic right of practicing what I practice or believe in what I believe. So there's intolerance of, of being together as a person. I don't know if it's inferiority complex that derives this. I don't really know. But I know I did a research uh, when I was working with OTI um, and NERI before I came. I did a research on intolerance. And most of the questions were basic questions that we asked people in the community. And you could see the hate, you could see the, the pompousness in them. Like, why are you asking me all of these questions when I'm inferior, when I'm superior than you? Especially coming from a woman again. And especially if I'm a Muslim and I ask, say, I ask a, a, a pastor or an imam even, they, do, they don't answer, they feel, how dare you? 
So there is no tolerance, there's no respect. That is so gone. I am still looking for a reason why that is gone and why, why it's diminished. But I don't know. Mostly I would say it's lack of education and you know, lack of, you know, just coexistence. It's 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 derailed and our culture, the difference in culture and ethnic groups is so many in Nigeria has it's given a bad vibe to, to tolerance, to religious tolerance in, in, you know, our regions. That's what I think, at least a little. Thank you, um, Chair Bargava. That's, that's all that I have at this point. I, I would yield over to the other commissioners to be able to ask some questions. <clears throat> Let me turn to the other commissioners. If you want to unmute yourself and, and ask a question, uh, please do. Thank you, Chairman Bargava. I have a question. First of all, thank you to our panelists. Uh, your testimony was incredible. Uh, Mr. Wolf, I did read that article. Uh, a giant in Africa is failing, and I too am troubled by genocide, as you mentioned, geno genocide by several groups. And Hazaf, what you said, what's happened to you and what you've seen breaks my heart. And uh, I've, I'm heartbroken by hearing your testimony and what you've experienced. Uh, there's a, an emerging interest in Nigeria. And this was an emergency hearing today recommended by all, all of our commissioners unanimously that we have this hearing. And I believe that's why we almost have 150 guests today. The world is concerned about what's happening there. I, for one, believe that Nigeria is better than this. And they need, they need to get their act together. Here's my question. How can we leverage our influence in this country to make sure that the government takes security more seriously, arrests and prosecutes the perpetrators of violence and ensure that religious freedom is protected. And I would address that to any of you. Father, I believe you're muted if you're, if you're trying to, to share, which I think you are. Yeah. Oh. One of the advantages when, when President Bush and Colin Powell appointed John Danforth, John Danforth then had the credibility that when he went to Sudan, he met with the leaders of Sudan and he was able to speak. And when he spoke, he was basically speaking for the White House. He was basically speaking for Colin Powell. It takes a strong person who's not partisan, not political to be able to go. Secondly, John Danforth was, was able to engage the British he was able to engage surrounding European countries. He was able to engage the UN. So you need one person who has it. You almost remember uh, during years ago in Colombia, they, went, they, had, they had a plan Colombia. They looked at every aspect with regard to Colombia. You need a plan Nigeria, Lake Chad region. Again, it isn't just Nigeria. The people Chad are impacted. People of Burkina Faso, Mali, the surrounding one. So some person who can come in and speaks for the administration. And when he meets with the president of Nigeria and the surrounding presidents, when he meets with the ambassadors and all the surrounding ambassadors, he speaks for the president of the United States and the secretary of state and has the ability to mobilize our government as well as the World Food Program to get, to get the World Pro Program to put things in. So I think that's what you really, really need. There's a lot of problems. And I think Danforth laid out, of course, and if you look at the State Department list, there are many special envoys. I believe, and I may very well be wrong, I, hope I, am, I believe that Nigeria will implode. And what frightens me to think that if this were happening in Scandinavia, if this were happening in Eastern Europe, do you think the world would be silent? The world would be engaged. And right now the world's not engaged. And we in the United States, we are not engaged. Thank you, Congressman Wolf. Uh, Father Baturi, let me turn to you, and then and then Hafsid, I'll turn to you after that. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, I just want to say something with regards to the question and uh, how we have, how we have been living, as Hafsad had, had mentioned. Yeah, uh, over time you see Muslims and Christians living together, you know, fellowship together in terms of uh, their religious festivities, both Christmas and Eid uh, al-Kabil uh, or Eid al-Mubarak. But now we have seen religious intolerance. Uh, that this is responsible for the political 
instability in Nigeria. And uh, this is because the political leaders have seen religion as a tool to manipulate the vulnerable uh, ma uh, masses of the society. In the light of the above, there is need uh, for, uh, uh, to revive national consciousness, as uh, the congressman just mentioned earlier on. Uh, Nigeria is, is much, much better than this. Uh, Jobis, you will agree with me when we met in New York uh, a couple of years back prior to the COVID-19. Uh, we did talk about issues like this. And uh, the recent past uh, ambassador to the United States, uh, Simonton, whom I know very well, with John Campbell that I met in Washington uh, in Virginia uh, a couple of years back, we did talk specifically about this. And uh, Ambassador Simonton visited me here in my own uh, university or Federal University, Wukari. And we talked about the farmers headers issues. And we talked about religious uh, tolerance among our people. But we've observed that time, just in a limited time, right now, as I speak to you, there is a serious crisis between farmers and headers. And the undertone there is a religion. The intolerance is getting so entrenched and deep into us that even the younger ones, the little children know that there is a problem. And this problem is emanating from religion. Like I discussed with uh, uh, the former ambassador, uh, Simonton, I told him that uh, we have been taking risk going to those places. We are the grassroots people. We see the people suffering. They come up to us. They tell us this is a problem. And we've gone to the government and the government is not doing anything about it. We can talk about the better years that we have in the time past, but that is as a Catholic priest, I don't have a constituency apart from the Catholic church, which helps me to go to the Muslims, the Christians and the traditionalists. Right now, I'm even working on issues that pertains to the Christians and the Muslims and the traditional uh, worshipers about places of worship, which has been desecrated based on this intolerance issue. And I think that, like I did mention, that this is not an academic issue. This is a practical issue that involves the life of people. And as a Catholic priest, I stand on the principles of uh, justice and peace of the Catholic Church that taught me and my other colleagues on how to reach out to others. The intolerance in Nigeria is so deep and the, and the politics of religion is so deep that the political leaders are now playing on the ignorance of the people to kill them. And I believe that this panel will not just go like that. We've been doing a, a little bit of a risky job of going up and down with the kidnapping issues. The priests have been kidnapped and killed, as you must have seen in the, in the media, and, 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 and issues that involve a marriage that I did mention, uh, which has no recourse to parent uh, or no parental consent, has created so much division, especially in my own community. And then the places of worship too, where you say this place is for, for, for Christian, or the Christians are building their churches, and uh, overnight it is destroyed or the Muslims are building their mosque and it is overnight they said, no, this is not depending on which part of the country you are. So these are issues that we truly need to look into. And uh, the whole bulk of the blame, and I want to be very emphatic here, is based on the political leaders and the constitution did not help matters either because the constitution of Nigeria, if you really looked at it, it favors one religion over the other. And that is why people are now craving and people are now understanding stuff that they want to be represented. Other than that, it's, it's, it's still going to be the same uh, chaos. And I hope that uh, this panel will pr practically do something about it. And we're truly doing something about it. Thank you. Thank you, Father. I know that Hafsat and both, uh, both Hafsat and Mike wanted to get in. So let me turn to Hafsat and then I'll turn to you, Mike. 
Yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to add to what Father Mike, uh, Father Baturi said um, about uh, the Constitution. Uh, for so long, concerned and patriotic Nigerians have, you know, for a very long time demanded a constitutional review and amendment based on the conviction that not only a huge part of the constitutional provisions is unrealistic, obsolete, and not workable. You know, in this age and time and millennia, we have problems rather than solutions. The Constitution has a lot of um, problems here and there. And like Father Baturi said, people are coming to understand this. But this is what I believe. See, what I believe is that the, 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 the politicians in Nigeria are allowing this Constitution to be the way it is and not really looking into it or listening to people that are saying, amend the constitution, review it, change some stuff, do, do this, just because they want to keep it that way to keep chaos in Nigeria. I believe, I believe, and this is my opinion, that they are actors, state actors, federal actors that are, that are driving these conflicts in Nigeria and are, you know, making it, uh, uh, allowing it to escalate just because they want to keep it that way and come out at the end of the day after millions or thousands of people are 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 dead or are misplaced and come out and act as the good guy this is what i believe and i believe at the end of the day nigeria has to separate religion and state whether they like it or not when it comes to the constitution if not it's not going to stop it's a time bomb. You know, the first bomb has exploded. The second bomb has, is exploding. The Boko Haram uh, crisis is the first bomb. The herders and farmers crisis is the second bomb. And the third bomb is likely on its way if nothing is done. And, you know, our, our system is not changed. They really need to look into it. And like Mr. Um, uh, Commissioner Wolf, like he said, there needs to be a bipartisan delegate that will go to Nigeria, sit down and talk with the government, not only the president. I believe the president will listen, but really cannot act because he has state actors and other people with him who would tell him what to do after they have long been gone. This, it's, 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 it's something that needs to be planned strategically and uh, 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 people have to come to a table and think outside the box. This is what I believe. And I will save my other comments for later. I have some things jotted down. <laughs> Thank you so much. Mike, let me turn to you. Thanks. Um, uh, thanks for those excellent interventions. And to, to drill down maybe on uh, Commissioner Carr's question, which I also understood was focused, especially on the security and US sort of security cooperation. Um, I'd point to um, uh, three sort of things that I think the US could be doing differently um, or, or more of. Um, the first is uh, we know that 77% of Nigerians say that the last time they asked for something from the police, they were asked to pay a bribe. Um, and without progress uh, in our in the bilateral relationship on uh, corruption and public per perception, because perception is reality in some uh, to some extent uh, of military of the military's accountability and effectiveness and in the security apparatus, it's very difficult to see how the security forces can deliver uh, a change. Um, and those are just really tough uh, public opinion numbers uh, in terms of public confidence. Uh, and it makes it a lot harder for them to do their job. I'd, I'll suggest also looking at structures like the National Human Rights Commission in Nigeria, which does have a mandate to uh, investigate and hold accountable public officials for abuses of human rights, abuses of power, uh, and other kinds of, of anti-corruption um, and, and human rights abuse mechanisms. The second is that the nature of the crisis is such that you have such a massive deployment of the Nigerian military um, uh, across the country that there's very little uh, capacity. Um, so for example, the situation in the Northeast with ISWAP as it deteriorates, there's a challenges in, in moving troops from other parts of the country to, to deploy against that challenge when they're tied down in security operations elsewhere. And that points to a real fundamental question in US security assistance of who does what and who are we supporting to do what? Right now you have soldiers uh, who instead of war fighting are being tied into community mediation pro uh, processes or investigating uh, livestock that have been rustled or uh, reports of, of um, young people being trained and armed in different parts of the country, which is not necessarily the war fighting mission that a military unit uh, force has been trained to do. 
But to the extent that no one else is being trained and equipped, that the civilian agencies aren't being supported, that the local uh, government areas, the LGAs, that uh, efforts like the Plateau Peace Building Agency and Plateau State or in, in Adamawa, that civil society who have the access to track down uh, and do an early warning, early response type system before events happen, then the military is naturally called to step into that role, which isn't theirs. They don't necessarily always do it well. They don't have the capacity to do it. And it raises and redoubles the issues of corruption. So I would encourage actually, there's some role of security assistance, actually a lot of security that's not the role of the security forces. And so the effect, to the extent that we're supporting uh, civil, you know, conflict mediation, dispute resolution, civilian led uh, uh, peace building efforts, that takes things off the plate uh, of, the, of the security forces. And then finally, uh, the third is, as we heard from, from Congressman uh, uh, Wolf uh, in his focus on, on sort of the degree to which the World Food Program, as he cited, and, and the, the sort of the food insecurity uh, more generally in driving this, um, as Father Baturi and, and Hassad both uh, alluded to the political dimensions, we know that actually a lot of the drivers of the security crisis are going to be the elections. Um, and so how is US electoral assistance and the election strategy um, being brought to bear? So it doesn't create more problems. And in fact, moves towards some of these positive, uh, you know, uh, uh, solutions to some of the long running problems. How are we bringing our food assistance and or uh, agricultural development or our trade policy uh, to bear? So I think then that comes back to this question of sort of the whole of the US whole of government response. Um, and so I would, uh, I would focus on those three sort of corruption within the security apparatus and how we're addressing corruption and perceived corruption to sort of the security realm uh, that, that sort of the right actors attacking the right problems. And third, uh, sort of bringing the whole of the US government to improve um, rather than looking for just a magic bullet within the security uh, realm itself. Thank you to each of you um, for, for those responses. I, let, me, let me now turn to Commissioner Davey. Uh, and then I think we have a few other commissioners who have questions if we have time, but let me turn to Commissioner Davey first and then we'll get to uh, some of the other commissioners as well. Sure, thank you, Chair Bagarva. And again, I wanna thank uh, all of the panelists uh, for their contributions. Um, I'm really interested in um, sort of where the strengths are in terms of institutions in uh, Nigeria that, you know, if we had the special envoy as Congress Congressman Wolf has advocated, uh, uh, if we had uh, sort of other uh, interventions as have been discussed, what would be the strongest sort of both religious and institutions of civil society that uh, as special envoy or, uh, or other partners uh, might engage uh, to advance some of the interests, obviously, that we're all, uh, that we've all discussed here today, from uh, religious freedom to ending corruption to greater security to uh, dealing with the conflicts between um, herders and farmers. Um, uh, I know, Father Baturi, you mentioned the Roman Catholic Church and your ability to appeal to them. But what are those other institutions uh, that are strong in, in uh, Nigeria that could be uh, that could be leveraged, that could be coordinated and partnered with to address some of these pressing questions? Um, so one of one um, institution that I can rightly or a group of people I would like to say is the the philanthropists. The philanthropists in Nigeria are not well engaged when it comes to um, these kind of things. And I believe they are a go-to when it comes to these kind of situation, the philanthropists, because there is so much poverty. There is so much um, uneducated people. And, you know, it's sad to say that the philanthropists are those who feed them in a good way. And, you know, they are those who they go to because a lot of them don't even trust their leaders, their senators, their, their representatives. They don't trust them because they believe they are corrupt. But they do go to the philanthropists. They do go to the religious leaders, like uh, the, 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 the Father, Father Baturi, and they do go to some imams. But these days, especially in the northern part of Nigeria, we've had issues where a lot of uh, 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 imams are preaching otherwise. And this is an issue that, you know, the, the, the US needs to look into as well. 
when it comes to the preachings, what are they saying? They need to be tracked. They need to be laws on, and licenses of who can preach and who cannot. There was a certain kind of law that was supposed to be placed, but I don't know what happened to that. But this is one of the issue. We need to find stakeholders who live in the community, not in Abuja, not you know in, in, here in U.S. while they are senators or other other countries. They, they, we need to find people who are in the community, and then we need to also look at the traditional leaders. We need to engage them. The U.S. The US government can use these people as friends and 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 work with them and ensure that you know the people's voices are heard. You know, they go to the communities, they go down to the grassroots, they talk to these people. The president doesn't. You know, the senators, once they get elected, that's it. They do not go back to their constituencies. So we need to engage these kind of people, you know, the, the philanthropists, the, the some religious leaders and um, some traditional leaders. And, you know, just the layman that even, you know, sells orange in the market, but has a lot of people who listen to him, like the godfather. We need to look for these kind of people. And it's a tricky, tricky thing to do. Any others want to talk about institution? Uh, Father Vittori, let me turn to you. Yeah, I truly concur with uh, what Hafsad has said, uh, because uh, we are grassroots people, and uh, the whole situation uh, bounce back to us. I run an NGO. Each time there is a problem, uh, there's a crisis. The people ask, where is the government? Where are our representatives? Or they send us to take the message back to them. And they are the, we, sometimes we play the policymakers. Uh, whether they listen to what we present is another thing. Uh, they're only active during election. And of course, during elections, they come out, they give money to, you know, people, people are hungry, people are ignorant, and people want to move their lives. And you don't see the presence of government. This is what I kept crying on, in the lives of the people. The political leaders have completely divided. They've stayed on their own. They don't come, just like Hafsad has did mention, they don't come to their constituency. I am right here, and I've been going around meeting with the poor people. The traditional rulers are often not listened to, but they are the ones that practically deal with the people at the grassroots too. So when we have an envoy, just like Commissioner uh, Fred David did mention, uh, there is needs to meet with those people at the grassroots. And once they do that, they will be able to really get the core of the message and how people, I mean, people don't believe in uh, the government anymore because they have been displaced, nobody goes there. And then the Justice and Peace Commission of uh, the Catholic Church all over, you know, the country. They are the ones that are first on the ground to help the people with uh, uh, materials that will help them in, their, in their, their own little way, both Christians and Muslims. I live in an institution, I teach in an institution, and I'm a chaplain of an institution. When there's crisis here in my community between Christians and Muslims, they all run to the same place. And we are the ones who are there. So I believe that the envoy, when they visited, they of course followed through the, the right channel, but the real people to meet is exactly as what Hafsad has said. Thank you, Father. And again, just to add, I'm sorry, just to okay. add to what Father said, um, when I talk about the religious leaders, the Muslim religious leaders, I would want us to note the local imams of those small masjids in the community not the famous imams that are on TV and whatsoever. The local imams, those are a key to go. I promise you, they are a key to go. The US government should really look at these people and just people like father, these are the people to go. And the institu another institution is the schools, the universities, the schools, they need to be tapped into when it comes to eradicating these kind of situations. Thank you, Hafsad. Uh, let me turn to Commissioner Turkel uh, for, the, for the next question. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Bargawa. I wanted to begin by thanking our witnesses 
for their testimony, sharing their expertise on these uh, important issues. Uh, Nigeria is a surprisingly democratic society uh, with the government more interested in achieving local legitimacy than looking positive in the international uh, spotlight. This focus would make makes it particularly challenging and difficult uh, for the United States to influence the Nigerian government directly. I have two questions for everyone in the panel. Uh, how can the United States better partner with local civil society organizing uh, organizations fighting for peace and religious freedom in Nigeria? And also, is there any role for the United States to help with the bottom-up approach? Um, I could could take uh, some examples from from the U.S. perspective. I think there. Uh, uh, I'm a big believer that you can't. Uh, you can't start with what you don't have. Um, and so I would look at some of the things that the US has begun to support um, that are, are yielding results. So the um, USAID has a people to people reconciliation program uh, as it's called this aimed at building bridges and preventing violence in a couple of, of, con uh, of communities across the middle belt that seems to be relatively um, not promising. They're, they're making some investments. So I would look at some of the programs that already aim to do that and see where um, there's an immense resource gap and so where there's the potential uh, to scale from things that, that are already working. Um, the second on engaging the grassroots and as I listen to Hafsat and, and, um, and Father Bature, um, there's a, a tip, often a mistake um, by foreign diplomats, Americans and others or foreign analysts um, in, in a situation like that in Nigeria of confusing leadership and power based on authority rather than power based on influence. And if we enter and look at a grassroots situation and say, you know, it's a colonel so-and-so, general so-and-so, someone in, in a formal position in Abuja, uh, maybe in a position of, of, of uh, authority, but they're not necessarily in a position of influence. That's particularly true, for example, of women, many of whom are not in positions of formal, uh, uh, of formal authority, yet have an enormous uh, amount of influence. And so if you look at, you know, who's powerful, and you only look at those sitting in formal authorities, you ignore the grassroots, you ignore women, you ignore young people, you ignore the most credible religious actors who are often those in daily contact, like Father Vittoria was saying, with the people in favor of the formalized, but often quite distant hierarchies. So I would make those two suggestions as an approach um, to invest in things that are already working and, and see where we can take them to scale, where there are models like the Plateau State Peace Building Agency um, uh, community security architectures that they're rolling out to engage the grassroots and how we can sort of support those kind of efforts to take, take scale rather than cutting something new from whole cloth and imported from the outside. Uh, and, and then second, really reshift the lens of our diplomacy, the lens of our analysis uh, away from an obsession with formal authority to understand as the best of Nigeria's politicians do that there's a different set of actors who are highly influential particularly when you're dealing with stressed out, highly suffering uh, 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 people and, and focus on investing and engaging them, uh, many of whom are not the usual suspects. Does anyone else want to, to respond to this question? I know that actually Hafsad and, and Father Paturi, I think it got, started to go into this conversation even before the question um, on, uh, in response to the last one. So if, if you wanna add anything and, and certainly invite Tomas and, and Congressman Wolf to, to, to to join us as well in, in, in any response to this particular set of questions and how the US government can really engage uh, on the ground uh, from, a, from, from with, with those who are uh, to local, to use Hafsat's term, and, uh, and, and not the usual suspects to use others. So uh, Hafsat, I, I see you unmuted. Let me turn to you. And then if, if others want to get in, please do. Yeah, um, so I agree with, um, Javins uh, totally 100% like to keep working on the existing um, uh, uh, programs or 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 uh, whatever that's working right now. But also, they are they are a lot of this is this is another group of people that are being ignored when it comes to problem solving. People who are based here in the United States who are Nigerians. To be honest with you, people like me who have a vast experience with working with local actors and, 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 and helping a lot of NGOs come to life in northern part of Nigeria and you know working with the government. We are here as immigrants or refugees, but yet we are so absolute, we are so idle 
when it comes to these things that we know and this information that we can also give and say, okay, well, if you come up with this, or if you're doing this, this, that, 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 we're not engaged properly when it comes to problem solving. So I would say to uh, Chair Turk to engage local Nigerians who are here in the United States. There are a lot of um, there's a, 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 a lot of us who know um, what we can add to way before you know, a team is sent to Nigeria to work with people like Father Father uh, Bature, so on and so forth. So also look at people who are here, who know what's going on back there or have had firsthand experience with, you know, what has transpired back in Nigeria to work to work on ex what's already existing, like um, Mr. Javin said. If I could jump in uh, briefly as well, um, the, the issue of US influence and leverage has now come up a number of times, both Commissioner Turkel and also Commissioner Carr raised sort of you know, how, how the United States might um, seek to bear influence on these issues. Um, uh, Congressman Wolf brought up um, you know, one possible option for the United States, which would be the appointment of a, of a special envoy to cover sort of this the, the challenges in Nigeria within the sort of a regional context. Um, I, you know, I would also note that uh, on the role of, of perhaps um, Congress uh, and how, how members might, might look at this, you know, broadly speaking, of course, uh, members of Congress, um, I think can pursue various options uh, depending on their assessment of, of the factors underpinning uh, these threats to religious freedom, as well as their determination of kind of the appropriate role for the US government here. Uh, the, the issue of U.S. assistance has come up. Um, several of the panelists raised, you know, possible options for U.S. development assistance, U.S. security assistance to Nigeria. I would also flag um, uh, the issue of, of punitive actions, um, particularly targeting the government. This is one uh, option that, that some members of Congress have called for as a, as a way to perhaps create leverage or uh, uh, exert U.S. leverage over the Nigerian government. Um, I, you know, I would remind the, the commission as well as the, the viewers that um, the punitive actions that, that are called for pursuant to the International Religious Freedom Act were waived for Nigeria um, following Nigeria's CPC designation in late 2020. So some members and other policymakers um, uh, may uh, sort of call for the, those punitive actions to be you know, brought to bear uh, on the Nigerian government uh, if they perceive that those punitive actions would be helpful in encouraging certain actions. Uh, and then sort of more broadly, you know, there are other um, uh, punitive measures or other sort of diplomatic uh, actions that can be taken pursuant to a range of, of authorities that, that the U.S. government, that Congress has provided to the U.S. government um, within, within the realm of foreign policy. So I'll, I'll pause there. Thank you so much, Thomas. All right, we have a minute left. I'm gonna actually turn to, to Commissioner Manza who for the final question and then I uh, then we can close out. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you again to the panelists for your excellent presentations. And I've been enjoying the conversation with you among yourselves, just as talking through such a complicated situation. And it really shows the you know, multifaceted approach really is the only way that we're gonna move forward. But I was curious if there were any bright spots. Are there places where you've seen certain programs, whether the US program or just, you know, as I know you talked about working with the traditional leaders as, as being important. But I was just curious if there was something that was working that we could grow on um, as we go to, you know, look at recommendations um, for things US government can do to to move um, Nigeria towards religious freedom. Yes, back in Nigeria, before I came, I know there were so many nice programs that we had organized with the Interfaith Mediation Center and uh, when I was working for Creative Associates. And these programs are simple. We just took youths that are likely to be influenced by extremists and we just gave them something to do. Something as simple as selling fruits something as simple as you know volunteering to clean the hospitals to just we gave them things to do to make them feel responsible to their communities and to the people they live with you know these are simple things that we just made we just fine tuned it you know in such a way that that they would appreciate it more and they will feel like they are seen and then we also 
I know there's a program that we also did in schools, sports. We had a lot of sporting programs that we had the local leaders and the, the, like the counselors, the chairman, and um, some, sometimes the senators even, you know, uh, would come and it would make the, the it, it made the community seen. It made them feel loved. And, you know, these are things, they are little things that will work, you know, from grassroots up, policing, uh, poli uh, uh, community policing. I know there was one time as well that we were working on community policing and engaging the community with the police where they had dialogues. This also worked at that time. We had, at that particular community, it was peaceful, you know, and people were, were pinpointed without fear because the police and the community were working together. Congressman Wolf, please, please go ahead. Thank you, thank you for, for the hearing. Uh, you read Ambassador Campbell's piece, you know how bad it is. I will end with, with this. There are many good people in Nigeria. They're looking for the United States to do something. The reason the commission was set up back in 1998 was to be a truth teller. There was strong opposition to the commission because the State Department didn't want it, people didn't want it outside. The commission is to be a truth teller, to be, and say so you all have the opportunity to do something don't so me to be like Esther in the Bible for such a time like this. You all can do something. And if you embrace these issues and push and push, you can help solve the problem and save the people of Nigeria. Thank you. Well, as always, Congressman Wolf, you have left us on a, at, a, at a great place to end this hearing, which is that uh, to speak truth, um, to act, and to do what we can. And I want to thank each one of you for, uh, for, for joining us today. Uh, both in the audience and as, as our expert witnesses. Uh, it has been an honor to be able to hear from you. And, uh, and we will take all of what we've learned um, through this hearing and, um, and, and move forward um, in, in how we're doing our work to protect religious freedom um, around the world. Thank you so much for being here.